Welcome to part five of my daily iPad workflow. In this part, we're gonna be covering all the creative aspects of my workflow. So video production, podcasting, and photography. Like always, I'll put links to everything in the description below, so let's go ahead and get into it. It's probably no surprise to anyone, but video production is the largest part of my workflow. I have a pretty standard YouTube setup. I'm using a Canon EOS R to film with a 15 to 35 millimeter lens, uh, aperture light to light everything, a Sennheiser mic to, well, get audio, and a bookshelf in the background. Pretty, pretty standard YouTube setup. It's what happens after I'm done filming, that's when things get interesting. So when I'm done filming, I take all that footage off my camera, off those SD cards, and put them onto my iPad. The application I use to edit is called LumaFusion. When you use LumaFusion, it creates a folder on the On My iPad section in the Files app. So this way it keeps all your stuff local. Video files aren't really something you want syncing up to the cloud. It'll take forever, especially 4K video files. Typically what I do is under the user media folder, I'll create a folder for each project. Then I'll create subfolders in there for A roll, B roll, audio, whatever. This is a big reason on why I use a one terabyte iPad Pro. Video production just takes up a ton of space. Like I mentioned, the editor I use is LumaFusion. As of right now, it's hands down the best video editor on the iPad. It's one of the few video editors that has multi-track support, chroma key support, effects. Uh, you can animate things using keyframes and, and a whole bunch of other features like you would expect to see in something like Final Cut or Adobe Premiere Pro. As far as video editing goes, it's a pretty standard piece of software as far as using it. If you've ever used Adobe Premiere Pro or Final Cut or anything like that, you'll get a handle on LumaFusion pretty quickly. If not, I will put a video video in the description on how I edit videos, basically going through the timeline and going through my video editing process. If you've been around the channel for a little while now, you might've noticed I've started doing some animated titles like this one. I'm not doing those through LumaFusion, but I've been using an app called Mojo. Mojo is definitely for the Instagram story crowd, but you can absolutely take it and make it your own if you're doing something for YouTube or really any kind of video editing. Like I said, Mojo is very much for the Instagram story crowd, so it tries to do the nine by 16 aspect ratio by default. You can change that to a 16 by nine or whatever. Honestly, the way I use it, the aspect ratio of the video doesn't really make a difference. So there's a whole bunch of presets in here, but I just start off with a blank canvas, and then I'll go through the presets and find what I want in order to kind of make the title I would like. There's a whole bunch of presets in here for specific titles or like lower thirds or any kind of animation thing you would want. There's even a whole section dedicated to social media icons. Then what I'll do is I'll kind of look at my title and determine what color is not in my title. So if there's no green, I'll make it a bright green. That way when we export it here and we put it back into LumaFusion, all I'll do is key out the background. So that way all that I'm left with is the title. This is a really convenient way of making animated titles quickly. So I don't really know how to pronounce this next app, but again, I'll put a link to it in the description below, but I'm just gonna call it Emuliso, maybe, I don't know. But anyways, this app will stabilize shaky footage. So in applications like Adobe Premiere Pro, you have things called warp stabilizers. So if you have really shaky B-roll footage or anything that's handheld and it's kind of shaky, what it typically does is it'll analyze the photo, zoom in a little bit and kind of start to adjust for the shakiness. And typically it does a really good job. Well, LimaFusion doesn't have anything like that built in. So I've been using this app. I don't like to use it for everything, but you know, every once in a while you just have a really shaky B-roll shot and you just need to stabilize it. And that's what this is for. I wouldn't use it for every clip, but every once in a while it's totally fine to use. Most people won't notice any warping or anything that it does add to the clip. We recently ended A Slab of Glass. That was my podcast where we talked about the iPad and productivity and things like that. Um, but a lot of people have still asked about a podcasting workflow on the iPad. And while I don't have a podcast at the time, I still guest on quite a few podcasts. So I still have all that stuff set up here. For doing a podcast, I would say the most important step is the preparation. So podcast prep is done a lot of different ways, kind of depends on how the co-hosts want to do things and if they want to include their guests or however. There's a bunch of different ways to, to accomplish this. 
The way we did it when we were doing a slab of glass is we use Google Docs. Google Docs is probably the best collaborative service because you can see what the other person is typing in real time. Yeah, you can do it in notes, but you don't see that in real time. It takes a minute to refresh, so you guys might be typing the same thing at the same time. Google Docs is the best for that, but it's not great on the iPad. Honestly, if I was to start up a podcast again, I would probably just go with Apple Notes or something similar to that. Podcast recording is probably the trickiest part of doing a podcast on the iPad. Typically, the way it works is all the hosts are having a phone call, Skype call, FaceTime audio call, some sort of conversation part between them. So that's an audio stream right there. But then each podcast host needs to be recording their own local audio track. Now, you can't do this on the iPad. You can't have both a call and record your own local audio. That's doesn't support multi-stream audio yet, which is something I really, really want. To get around this, I have to use an external audio recorder. I use a Zoom H4n. Now, basically what this does is it has a SD card port so I can record my local audio track right to this. Plug my microphone into the Zoom H4n. Now, the mic I use is a Shure SM7B. It's kind of a professional mic. I use it a lot for any time I need to do voiceovers and things like that. It is not a microphone I would recommend for starting off doing a podcast. Um, I'll put a couple of recommendations for beginner podcast mics in the description below. When I go to record a podcast, I just hit the record button on the Zoom H4n. That'll start recording to the SD card. When we're all done, stop the recording, put the SD card into my iPad, and then copy those files off. But that's only about half the issues right there. The co-hosts that I'm on the podcast with also still need to be able to hear me. I use the line out port from the Zoom H4n and then put that into my Scarlett Solo. And then my Scarlett Solo gets plugged into my iPad. This way my co-host can actually hear a good clean audio stream of what's coming from my microphone through the Skype call or FaceTime call or whatever. I also plug my headphones into the Scarlett Solo. This way I can hear my co-host and hear myself so I can monitor my own audio. I haven't had to edit a podcast in a while, but when I do, the podcast editing app that I use is Ferrite. It's such a good application for editing spoken word audio. It's designed specifically for that. I know a lot of podcast editors like to use Logic and Adobe Audition and stuff like that. And while those are fine, they were kind of meant more for music, not so much long form audio. With Ferrite, I import all the tracks, line them all up. Once they're all lined up, I use the strip silence feature in Ferrite. This will pull out all the blank bits of audio. So basically you'll just be left with blocks of audio. It makes it a lot easier to kind of listen through and edit the audio tracks. You can move things around a lot easier. Now, one thing I really like about Ferrite is it has customizable keyboard shortcuts. So what I did is I actually went in and made the match Luma Fusion. So the two editing apps that I use, the keyboard shortcuts essentially match. But at this point, I just listen through, clean up any mistakes, take out any pauses, ums, any kind of like mouth noises and anything that just doesn't really need to fit in the podcast. This is where I'll go through and kind of cut all that out. Also make some editor choices and things like that. If a topic just isn't interesting, I'll cut the whole topic. Photography is something that I got into last year and I am really enjoying it. Unfortunately, you know, with COVID and everything happening this year, I wasn't able to take as many trips as I was last year to really take nice photos, but uh, it's really something I hope to get back into next year. But I have been taking photos around the house of just random objects to kind of keep my skills up essentially. Also, I take photos for all the thumbnails for my videos. I use my EOS R to take all those photos, nothing special there, um, but I do edit them, of course, on my iPad. The application I use is Lightroom. Now, Lightroom isn't the best photo editing app on the iPad, but it's the app that I'm used to. It's the app that I know the best. Plus, I have a bunch of presets that I've made, and I've even bought a few presets over the years that are in Lightroom that I don't really want to give up. If you're just starting off with photo editing, I would really look at something like Darkroom if you want to learn the ins and outs of photo editing. Or if you'd rather just have an application take care of it all for you, Pixelmator Photo is great. It has an ML button in there that stands for machine learning. If you hit that, it'll use machine learning to determine what kind of edits should be applied to that photo. 
and then just apply them. You don't have to do anything. But Lightroom is the application I use. I can go through here, change all the exposure, contrast, colors, um, add effects like vignetting and things like that. Any Anything that I wanna do to a photo, I can do in Lightroom and I'm pretty happy with it. But if I need to add like text or a shape or something to a photo for like a thumbnail or something, that's when I use Pixelmator. Not Pixelmator Photo, but just regular Pixelmator. For a while there, I was kind of getting worried thinking the application was dead, but it's actually starting to get a lot of updates recently. Uh, and it's probably the best like compositing photo app for the iPad. Uh, we have things like Photoshop and Affinity Photo, but those are way more advanced than what I need. When it comes to compositing photos, typically all I'm doing is putting two images on top of each other or adding text or a shape or something like that. Nothing too special that requires me to use something like Affinity Photo or Photoshop. Before we get into the next part, this might be really handy. My channel is now sponsored by Paper Lake. Paper Lake is a screen protector that adds a kind of a texture to the iPad. So when you're using the Apple Pencil with the iPad, it feels like you're writing on paper. It's actually really nice, especially if you're a heavy Apple Pencil user. Like I said, Paper Lake is a sponsor of my channel now. I will put my link in the description below, so be sure to check it out. So this is actually the final part of my daily iPad workflow series, at least for now. Maybe in a year or two, I'll come back to it and update it. But for right now, this is the final part. So I just kind of want to go over a couple of things really quickly. Mostly like where the iPad falls short for me. It's not a perfect device. The iPad totally has room to grow, but personally that's what I think is exciting about it. General computers have been around for so long, we know what they are, they're, they're, they're stable. But the iPad is still growing, it's still becoming a new platform and I think that's actually really interesting. So one of the things I really want to see is pro apps from Apple. So Final Cut Pro, Logic, uh, Xcode, things like that. Those are Apple's core pro applications. I'd love to see Motion and Compressor as well. I think those are the apps that we really need in order to take the iPad to the next level. Now, one of the other things that I think we need is true external monitor support because the iPad is a tablet right now, and it's also a laptop with the Magic Keyboard. But if we had true external monitor support, it could also be a desktop computer as well. And then it becomes like this perfect transformer of a computer. There's a bunch of other pro features I would like to see, um, like Time Machine and things like that. But I would say the external monitor and pro apps are the two core things we need to see in order for the iPad to go to the next level. I love the iPad. It's hands down my favorite computers. I've been building and messing around with computers since I was a kid. I, I've started using computers during Windows 95. Like, I'm not new to using computers at all. But the iPad's my favorite computer, hands down. And it's just a great computer because of how modular it is. At one minute, it's a tablet, and then I can pull out the Apple Pencil, and it's a notebook for taking notes. Then I can put it in the Magic Keyboard, and it's a laptop. There's a whole bunch of things you can do with it that just make it a really awesome computer. So that's it for part five, and this will wrap up the series of my iPad workflow. Thank you all so much for watching. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. I will also put links to all the other parts in the description below if you missed those by any chance. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day.